Thank you. You may be seated. Please take your Bible. Excuse me. Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a few moments ago in the Book of Exodus, Exodus chapter five. The message entitled "Expect Trouble When You Want to Serve God." Exodus chapter five. <coughs> excuse me. Exodus chapter five, and we'll be looking at the verses four through eighteen today, the Lord willing. Before we begin, let's open with a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power. Your word is infinite. It has infinite resources in it. It has infinite instructions in it. It has infinite applications in it. And Father, we are your people living at this period of history in which we see some things taking place in our government that are very much like what happened with the children of Israel under the bondage and yoke of Pharaoh. Father, we pray that you will give us accuracy in the interpretation and then appropriateness in the application of this portion of text as we look at our society around us. Father, we commit this text to you and pray that you'll open our ears and our hearts to hear what you would have to say to us this day. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now you recall that last week was simply Memorial Day Sunday, so we were out of the book of Exodus. We looked at Joshua, what mean these stones. But the week before that, on May 18th, the message was entitled, What About a Three-Day Vacation? And we looked at verses 1, 2, and 3, which we read again this morning. We saw that the verses that preceded that were very important because God has been speaking to Moses and Aaron immediately at the end of chapter 4, verses 27 through 31, and we find that Moses and Aaron obey, and they go. They do what God has told them <clears throat> to do. They've gathered the children of the elders of the children of Israel together. They've spoken to the elders the words of the Lord. When the elders and the people, it says, heard what the Lord had done, that he had visited the children of Israel, and that he had looked on their affliction, then they bowed their heads and worshipped. So we have a perfect setting for what we might expect to be a good response from Pharaoh. Moses and Aaron are back in fellowship. Moses and Aaron have spoken exactly what God has told them. Moses has performed the various miracles that God gave him to do, as we saw in verse 28 of the preceding chapter. The people have believed, it says so in the text, and the people are in a state of reverence and worship. What a backdrop for going into Pharaoh. You would feel confident, I think, if you had to go before some powerful leader, if you had to come and speak a word from God, and you knew that at least six million people were praying for you, specifically. <laughs> Do you not think that you would go with an excitement? But what a response they got from Pharaoh. And we saw last two weeks ago that the first lesson we learned from this is the lesson of frustrated faith. Too often we expect immediate results to our faith and worship. God has made promises that he will certainly keep to us, but his timing and his ways are not always our ways. They went in and God was going to keep his promises, but he didn't keep them exactly the way they thought he was going to keep them. We learned four principles from lesson number one. In spiritual warfare, there's rarely uh, an instant and permanent victory. It's a war, not a skirmish. Number two, in the walk of faith, there is rarely instant gratification. It's a walk, not a sit down. Number three, timing does not belong to man. Timing belongs to God. And number four, there will always be tests to our faith to do three things. Number one, to prove that our faith is real, not merely an attempted escape hatch for our problems. Number two, to strengthen our faith when we get resistance. That, as you know, those of you who have been in athletics know that you have to have some resistance. If there is no resistance to any of your movements, you do not develop your muscles. So that there will be strength to our faith. And number three, to develop our patience and to draw us closer to God. Tribulation worketh patience. God wants us to develop that 
Remember the verses immediately preceding the entrance of Moses into the presence of Pharaoh stated that the people were in a right relationship of faith and worship before God. Second lesson that we learned was the lesson of leadership disappointment. Leadership doesn't always get the results expected even when the leaders are doing the right thing and the followers are doing the right thing. Moses had already been through this process. He had difficulty because he tried to do things that were not right. And so he would probably anticipate now that he's doing things right, he would get different results. He tried to avoid God's command. He had made excuses concerning God's command. And third, he had tried to modify God's command because he didn't circumcise his son. God had already warned Moses that he was going to get a negative response from Pharaoh for three reasons. Number one, so that he could judge Pharaoh and all those under his authority. Number two, so that God could magnify himself. And number three, so that he could teach the people to trust and obey him and to follow Moses' leadership, which was very necessary later on. Because there is always a divine purpose when God causes things not to go smoothly for us. Remember, there is a divine purpose when God causes things not to go smoothly for us. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. It says so seven of the ten times that it talks about Pharaoh's hard heart. Three times Pharaoh hardened his heart, seven times God hardened Pharaoh's heart. The third lesson was God always works through human authority, even bad authority. And so as Moses and Aaron come in, you heard it today as we read that text, they said, please let us go. We just want to go three days, but they came first with a request before Pharaoh. And God does work through his authority. God could have chosen a different way. God could have simply killed everybody in Egypt and let the children of Israel walk out. God could have told the children of Israel, walk on out and I'll stand between you and Pharaoh, as he did at the Red Sea. But instead God chose to work through the authority, and thus when the authority rebelled against the command of God, God brought judgment on that authority. Lesson number four that we learned was resistance to small inconveniences results in big inconveniences. And we pointed out that Pharaoh thought it would be inconvenient to have his entire workforce for the land down for three days. And since he didn't want that inconvenience, he opted for the bigger inconvenience of all the miracles that Moses performed and all ten plagues, including the death of his own son. Not a very wise choice. Resistance to the small inconveniences that seem to stand in our way when God gives us commands to do things may result in much larger and even fatal inconveniences. God can use those, and God does use those. I encourage you to be here Wednesday evening. We talked about this past Wednesday evening, not this Friday, but the one before, when we had prayer meeting, it was when the rabbi says, come. And it's speaking, of course, of the Lord Jesus Christ and his call. The one that's coming up is when the rabbi says, go. And there are some responsibilities that are given to us as individuals when we obey versus the things that we would rather do that seem so inconvenient for us. Recently saw a Christian film that was put out called Soul Surfer. It's the true story of a young woman by the name of Bethany Hamilton who at age 17 was one of the top surfers in Hawaii. And she decided not to go on a mission trip to Mexico with the rest of her youth group she, because she was practicing for a big competition that's coming up. And while they were down in Mexico and she was out surfing, a shark attacked and bit off her left arm. small inconveniences versus large inconveniences. Now God can use even those difficult things as he did in her life to bring glory to himself and expand a ministry. But dear people, do you want to go through that? Or would you rather obey the first time around? Resistance to small inconveniences results in big inconveniences. Lesson number five. Don't expect unregenerates to obey God. Even if they know what God has said, don't expect them to obey. Moses and Aaron gave a direct command to Pharaoh from God. Look at how Pharaoh responded. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord. 
neither will I let Israel go. Don't know who God is, and so don't expect me to do what he tells me to do. Of course, very soon Pharaoh was going to learn who God was, and very soon he would have his pride and everything he owned crushed and obliterated in the process. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction, Proverbs 1.7. Now that picks up where we left off on May 18th. The sixth lesson that we learn as we move into our text today, number six, we must obey even when our authority figures do not obey. The whole process set in motion by Moses and Aaron coming to Pharaoh resulted ultimately in Israel obeying God and leaving Egypt so that they could permanently serve and sacrifice and worship God. The request had only been for three days. But ultimately, Israel not only left Egypt, but they were formed into a nation whereby they would have their own land, whereby they would have their own capital, whereby they would have their own temple, where they could worship God according to the dictates that God laid down for them in the law. You know, we don't always know what God would have done if Pharaoh had relented and willingly permitted them to go. But we do know a general principle. Perhaps he would have received a special blessing. Think about that. As I was preparing for this message, I was looking through all the different passages in the Old Testament prophets where Egypt is mentioned, more than a hundred of them. And in those passages, it often refers to Pharaoh. It often refers to the Exodus. It often refers to the stubbornness of Pharaoh. It often compares Pharaoh to Satan and Egypt, to the world. What a difference there would have been if one man, when he first heard the word of God, had said, yes, I don't know the Lord, but I would like to know the Lord. He's your God. Tell me about him. I'll obey him. I'll let you go for three days into the wilderness. Do you think there might have been a difference in the history of Egypt? Do you understand why it is so important for us to pray for those in authority over us, that we might lead quiet and peaceable lives in godliness and in honesty? God may never reveal to us what would have happened if Pharaoh had done something differently. But God knows what would have been different. In a few places in Scripture, he's pulled back the veil so that we can know what would have happened if something had been different. Jesus speaks of Chorazin and Bethsaida and Capernaum. And he says, if the works that have been done in you were done in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented and remained unto this day. Jesus came to Capernaum and Chorazin and Bethsaida. But if he had gone 2,000 years earlier to earth and done his mighty works in Sodom and Gomorrah, those vicious, vile, decadent, depraved cities would have repented and would have still been around 2,000 years later. God's ways are inscrutable. What would have happened if Pharaoh had repented? We do not know. But we do know this. Those who repent and obey receive God's blessing. The scripture is replete with illustrations of that. But whether or not those in authority obey God or do not obey God, we must always obey God. We have illustration of that in the book of Acts as we look at the works of the apostles. In two chapters, Acts chapter 4 and Acts chapter 5, we find the apostles are preaching Christ and they're called in on the carpet and told that they can't do it anymore. It's right after they've healed the man. And here we find the Sanhedrin saying, but that it spread no further among the people. Let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth no more in this name. And they called them and commanded them. Here's a direct command. It's not a suggestion. 
It's the Sanhedrin, highest religious law and in some senses highest temporal law too, though under Roman authority, commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Whether or not those in authority obey God or not is not the determining factor as to whether or not we shall obey God. We must always obey God. Those who repent and obey God receive God's blessing. Those of God's children who refuse to obey God or who are pushed into the corner of cowardice by some intermediate authority and thus do not obey God, they will receive the chastening hand of God. As you know, of course, the apostles continued to preach and heal in Jerusalem, and so they're arrested and thrown into prison in the next chapter. But the angel of the Lord opens the prison doors at night and tells them to go back into the temple and preach again. And so what do they do? They go right back to the temple and preach again. But you know, the Jewish leaders there were very much like Pharaoh. They had heard the message. They had seen the miracles. But they hardened their hearts, and they refused to repent. Therefore, two things happened. Number one, they lost the blessing that would have come from repentance and obedience. And number two, they came under the judgment of God. That group of highfalutin religious leaders who thought they knew the Bible well are in hell today. Now that they know what they know, do you think they might have made different choices had they known it back then? Folks, you don't get a second chance. When God gives you a command, when God tells you what to do, when it is clearly the word of God and you have no alternatives except disobedience, you had better obey. It's a serious issue that we're dealing with. Chapter 5, And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not straightly command you? Now the first time around we let you off because there was no precedent set, but we gave you a command back in chapter 4. Did we not straightly command you that ye should not teach in his name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. <laughs> How quickly they forgot that they had screamed to Pilate, his blood be upon us and upon our children. And now they're accusing the apostles, you're trying to bring his man's blood upon us. What a naughty thing for you to do. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers. And so he says, hey, that's a great introduction to a sermon. Let me tell you, I'm going to give you a short sermon right here. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses, his witnesses of these things. And so also is the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. Repentance and obedience are both mentioned in Peter's sermon there. Did you catch that? Exactly what Pharaoh would not do. For to give repentance to Israel. And then God hath given to them that obey him. When they heard that, they were cut to the heart. And they took counsel to slay them. Cut to the heart. And what did they do? They hardened their heart. Has the word of God ever penetrated your heart and you knew what you were supposed to do, but you decided... I will not do it. Instead, it makes me mad and I'm going to get some revenge out of this. Brings us to lesson seven. There are always consequences for not obeying that will fall on us if we don't obey. If we do obey, those consequences may fall on those who hinder our obedience. Let me say that again. There are consequences for not obeying that will fall on us if we don't obey. But if we do obey, those consequences may fall on those who hinder our obedience. Did you notice the consequences that God apparently had warned Moses about? It's not mentioned earlier in the text, but Moses states it as part of the message that came from God. 
Exodus 5, 3. And they said, The God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days journey into the desert and sacrifice unto the Lord our God. Now listen, this last phrase. Lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. God had told the children of Israel, if you refuse to do this, I'm going to hit you with a pestilence and with a sword. You think you're keeping yourself safe? You think that by disobeying me, you can sort of weasel out of the problem? Lest he fall on us with the pestilence or with the sword. We've got to go sacrifice. Otherwise, judgment will come on us. Pharaoh was sitting up there snickering to himself. Oh, really? Yeah, if you don't obey, God's going to smack you good. Yeah, let's see it. In fact, I'm going to make it so you can't obey, and then I'll watch as God smacks you. Let's see if he'll do it. What Pharaoh didn't realize that it was that at that very moment, he was flipping the page over to his own page, and that set of judgments was going to hit him. There's a serious warning, I think, for us here. If we try to hinder what God is doing in the lives of his people, we may discover that the judgment or his chastening that they would have received for disobedience is the very thing that falls on us. And people in the church sometimes do that. They hinder other believers from fulfilling God's purpose for those believers' lives because of pride, because of envy, because of jealousy or covetousness or they want the glory for themselves instead of letting the other person quote have the glory for whatever work was going to be done dear people be very careful you may find yourself in Pharaoh's shoes may God grant us the wisdom to not only make right choices for ourselves but also also for those who are under our authority in every sphere lesson number eight Knowing God personally and having his direct commands is not a guarantee that things will go smoothly in your life. Knowing God personally and having his direct commands is not a guarantee that things will go smoothly in your life. It certainly didn't for the Hebrews. And they said, The God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days journey into the desert and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall on us with pestilence or with the sword. And the king of Egypt said unto them, Wherefore do ye, Moses and Aaron, let the people from their works get you to your burdens? And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land now are many, and ye make them rest from their burdens. It didn't go smoothly, even though they were doing God's will. Lesson number nine, if you identify with God's people, you will come under the same restrictions placed on God's people. Did you notice how Pharaoh commanded Moses and Aaron to get back to work? Wherefore do ye, Moses and Aaron, let the people from the birds get you to your burdens? Did you notice something else? They did not obey Pharaoh. They were on an errand from a higher authority. If a general or a sergeant and a sergeant both give you conflicting commands, who are you going to obey? You know, you'd better obey the general, even if the sergeant gives you grief. You obey the highest authority in every instance. If an intermediate authority gives you a conflicting command or gives you a conflicting prohibition, you had better obey the highest authority. Moses and Aaron were told to get back to work. Moses and Aaron did not say, uh, yes, sir, we'll go back there and we'll, we'll start pulling out weeds so that we can have some kind of straw stuff so that we can uh, make bricks for you. Uh, sorry to bother you today. Uh, you won't, we won't be back again. You know, thanks for seeing us. Did they do that? They did not. Lesson number 10. When you're obeying God, expect to be falsely accused of wrong motives. When you're obeying God, expect to be accused of wrong motives. And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land now are many, and ye make them rest from their burdens. Moses and Aaron, you guys are to blame 
for the fact that I'm not getting as much work out of these people as I think I can get out of them. They're falsely accused. They're accused of wrong motives. Lesson number 11. Usually the secular authorities who oppose God, and here we begin to apply some things to the United States today. Usually the secular authorities who oppose God use intermediaries to carry out their dirty work for them. So, for example, don't be surprised if political authorities use non-political instruments such as the police, the fire department, the military, and the courts to come against God's people. The politicians, the ones who pull the strings and run the show, will use the intermediary authorities to come against God's people. Look at verse 6 here. Pharaoh commanded the same day the taskmasters of the people and their officers say. Oh, and what does he say? He says, we're going to make their work harder. We're not going to let them have straw. You're going to make them go out and they're going to have to gather their own straw. That brings us to lesson number 12. Expect the first level attack to be an economic attack that makes your work more difficult. When the political machine begins its attack against the people of God, one of the very first things that it does is it tries to make it economically more difficult for them. You see, Pharaoh removed the necessary ingredients that enabled them to do effective work. Expect some time in the future, and perhaps not too far in the future, that the government will remove the tax-exempt status of churches which will definitely truncate the effectiveness of their works of charity and mission. And having studied this somewhat in the area of law, I think that the attack will come in four different stages. The first stage, which we have seen played out in a couple of places around the country, test cases being fought in various places around the United States, will be the denial of deductions for donations to religious causes. That's the first thing that's going to go. Other nonprofits will still be able to keep their ability to issue tax deductible receipts. But the denial of the deductions is the first thing that's going to happen. The second thing I think that will happen is exemption from property tax will go next. In fact, when I lived in Alabama many years ago, in fact, this is at least 15 years ago, a major movement was raised in the city of Birmingham to try to remove the property tax exemptions from the churches because there are a lot of very large churches in Birmingham, Alabama. And they control some very prime pieces of real estate. Now, that issue was fought and it was won by the churches, but it's going to show its ugly head again. Exemption from property tax will go next. Churches will be directly taxed on their property and their buildings. That will do three things. Number one, it will reduce the amount of donated money that can be used for ministry purposes. Obviously, if money's coming in to the church, and then the church has to knock out a huge chunk of that to pay the government taxes, it means there's going to be a lot less money available for the work of ministry. Number two, Indirectly, this will make large gatherings of Christians in large buildings increasingly difficult. Church will be forced to downsize. Number three, it will have a dual impact of turning many church properties back over to the tax rolls as secular organizations buy out the church buildings because the churches can't pay their taxes. And what may happen will be what happened down the street here, the 20th Century Reformation Hour building, Fines begin to build up until the fines are equal to the value of the property and the government takes it at no cost to the government. It just is theirs. No eminent domain, no payment of a lawful price, of a fair market value. It just goes. Number three. Churches will then be taxed on any trust funds or interest incomes that is currently exempt. Number four, churches will then be actively taxed on donations received as though they were rendering taxable goods and services. 
not merely denying the deductibility, which is point number one, of donations to the donors. Now, they may come in different order than that, but folks, the handwriting's on the wall. I just, as you know, a month ago got back from a major conference in Washington, D.C., where we even heard from major representatives of the Internal Revenue Service is what's going on. Now it's going to affect nonprofit organizations. That's my primary interest in the law. And people wake up. We have a Pharaoh government. And what you learn from the principles of studying how Pharaoh handled the situation, yes, we know Pharaoh gets judged in the end. But the children of Israel suffered before it happened. Pharaoh removed the government benefit from the Israelites, which made their work harder. And the secular world looks at it as a government benefit that churches are tax exempt. He removed their benefit. Ye shall no more give the people straw to make brick, as heretofore the government was providing the straw. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. Not only are they not going to get the straw from the government, they're going to have to work extra hard to get more straw. Pharaoh still required them to do the same work as before. And you can expect the government to put the same kind of pressure on the church to do its same acts of charity and mercy with fewer resources in order to keep its nonprofit corporation status. Notice something else here in the text. The issue was specifically the desire of the people to serve God as he required. They're not making it up. This is not their own personal religion. This is not how they feel about the things of the universe. And they sit there and go, mm, all day long. This is serving God as he required. Exodus 5.8 And the tale of bricks which they did make heretofore, ye shall lay upon them. Ye shall not diminish aught thereof, for they be idle. Therefore the cry saying, let us go and sacrifice to our God. Do you know that's how the secular world looks at the church? What a waste of time, property, energy, and resources. That's how they look at people who are involved in leadership in the church. How they look at people involved in religious leadership in various parachurch organizations and ministries. Boy, they sure waste a lot of time. They're not being productive citizens. They're not going out there and, you know, building the economy. So why don't we take things away from them? After all, they're sitting fat and sassy and happy, and they've gathered a lot of resources together, and boy, we sure could use those resources. Dear people, that's the way the world thinks. Whether you like it or not, that's the way the world thinks. Whether it's fair or not, that's the way the world thinks. Whether or not it's true and righteous, that's the way the world thinks. Lesson 13. Oh, excuse me. Notice also that direct pressure was put on the men, the principal breadwinners of the family. Let their more work be laid upon the men, that they may labor therein, and let them not regard vain words. We'll put pressure on the men, because the men are the ones that are the leaders, and the men are the ones that are listening to Moses and Aaron, and so if we put more pressure on the men, they're going to have to provide for their families. They're not going to pay attention to those crazy religious guys, Moses and Aaron. Pharaoh understands how things work. Lesson 13. And our time is up. We're not finished the passage, but we'll, maybe the next week, Lord willing. Lesson 13. Special pressure will be put on the leaders of the religious organization. Those who answer to the governmental intermediaries. By that I mean pastors and elders and deacons and trustees. Look at verse 14. The officers of the children of Israel, which Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them. So there's Pharaoh. There are his officers, the taskmasters. And then there are officers who are Jewish. The, the taskmasters said, okay, you know, we get better response if we have a few Jewish leaders under us here who are telling their people what to do. Verse 14. The officers of the children of Israel, which Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and demanded... Wherefore have ye not fulfilled your task in making brick both yesterday and today as heretofore? These guys are the ones in the squeeze. The people have to go out and gather straw. They have to make bricks. But the Jewish 
officers who are under the taskmasters are now being beaten because their followers aren't doing what Pharaoh wants. Folks, where does Satan always attack? He attacks leadership. Smite the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. Satan understands that. Satan was behind Pharaoh. And so Satan began to put pressure on those who had intermediate responsibilities who were among the people of the Jews. Well, I wish we had more time for this. As you know, this is leading up to the Passover. The Passover is what was memorialized the night in which our Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed. The Passover speaks of Christ, God's Lamb. The one who shed his blood for our sins was buried and rose again. We're going to pause for a few moments. And we're going to come before the Lord and confess our sins. We spoke of it earlier. We're going to gather around the Lord's table. It's a moment of memorial. What Jesus had to suffer, the one who was perfect, at the hands of the world, the flesh, the devil, and the demonic forces. The servant is not above his master. Let's join together in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power. As we've gathered here today to worship you, to serve you, to sing your praise, to bring our corporate prayer requests, we now come to partake of the Lord's table. Father, cause it to remind us that our Lord Jesus Christ paid the ultimate price that we might have redemption. The sinless Lamb of God died for us who are sinners. May we have the boldness of the apostles that we've read in Acts 4 and Acts 5 to say we ought to obey God rather than men. Cause us to be sure that it's obeying you, not merely our own whims and wishes, but give us courage to obey. Father, we commit your word to you and pray that you will bless it to our hearts, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.